back on a Thursday night. Rory Johnston with you. Our guest is here from the Legal Aid Society, Tom Shinyovsky. Um, it's getting easier to say, Tom, but we really do appreciate uh, you spending this hour with us to kind of educate and uh, perhaps answer some questions. Speaking of, let's go to... If I can figure this out, there's fourth line two. We have a caller who has a question. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, I wanted to, my question is regarding uh, I had a job and uh, I had to go to court over the matter. And uh, the judge said that I could be, uh, they would send me to jail. And uh, they told me, that that if nothing uh, happened, uh, I would be all right and everything. And they said that uh, everything would be uh, cleared on my records. And I wanted to find okay. out regarding, it also took place in Davidson County. They told me I could go to jail over, it was a different case, but and every, each time they threatened me about jail and I was gonna know y'all's opinion. What would I could do about that? Thank you. Okay. Good, Tom. Um, yeah, there are unfortunately situations where people are told or are, are given to understand certain things about what may or may not happen. Obviously, we're all familiar with plea deals. They'll offer you the dismissal of two charges if you plead guilty to one. Uh, a lot of folks are given an opportunity to participate in what's called uh, pretrial diversion which is essentially a situation where we will suspend your conviction if you complete your probation successfully. At the end of that process, you'll be eligible to have that entire charge and conviction removed. Um, so in order to address those types of things, everyone's situation is unique and the analysis really is fact intensive. So for you to get really good answers, uh, go ahead and give me a call. Again, just Google Legal Aid Society. You're looking for uh, reentry or reentry screening, and we'll get you in touch with somebody who can get some more details and speak to you specifically about what the right steps are for you. And in fact, I believe we have uh, the information. Our producer's telling us that we can put up on the screen the contact information. We'll try to uh, run this one more time. Do we have that graphic? Uh Maybe. All right, we're going to be pulling it up here in just a second as we continue the conversation. Uh, there it is, 1321 Murfreesboro Pike, uh, phone number 244-6610, and it's las.org. Really easy, short web address there. That's the contact info. I'll show it to you one more time in just a minute. What do you think about, uh, just as you talked about pretrial diversion, uh, sentencing reform? Uh, is happening so that in the future, you know, we may not have to deal with a lot of these issues, but also I know it's a hot button topic. Uh, how do we reform these sentences, but also while reassuring our citizens who really believe strongly in law and order and crime and punishment? How do we get sure. to that balance? I mean, it's a, it's a difficult question and, and it depends whom you ask, I mean, as you point out, there are some people who inherently believe that you've done something wrong, society deemed it offensive, and you now should be marked for life with a scarlet letter, and you should be treated as a secondhand citizen. On the other end of the spectrum are people like me. Uh, I have a bankruptcy background, and there's one of the maxims in bankruptcy is that the process is for the honest but unfortunate debtor. And I think that a similar proposition applies to folks who are looking for a second chance. You have folks who are essentially honest, straight arrow folks. They get into a bad situation. They get pulled into a bad situation. Uh, but when they come out of the back end, if they're if they're if they're serious about the second chance, then then there are these steps that you know, again, will be discussed more at length in in private, but. As far as sentencing reform per se, uh, again, it's it's a it's a difficult question, and uh, you know we we at legally try to stay apolitical, but um, one of the issues that personally I find troubling is the entire institution of for-profit prisons. That is a very strong group with a lot of power, and they have a vested pecuniary interest in keeping folks in prison. So you have this kind of push and pull. 
Uh, I think that we're going to see sentences generally come down. I, I would like to think that certainly for example, for nonviolent drug offenders, sentences will come down. There'll be you know, uh, pretrial diversions or other forms of kind of probation in lieu of incarceration. But um, again, that is, you know, that, that's, that's a ping pong ball between two ends of the spectrum with the legislature in the middle. So it remains to be seen, you know, who's going to win that horse race first. Right. All right. Uh, here's kind of a, a, it's a big question, but what do you think is the one thing that we can do with the legal system, the, the whole system, to make this reentry process less difficult? I think that it should be looked at more through a lens of social services than of the legal and penal systems. Uh, again, I, I, I always go back to education, uh, establishing a base in a community, providing information, being able to plug into community organizations uh, and just to spread the awareness. Uh, a, a lot of those things, in my view, will, will go a long way towards essentially minimizing this entire universe of, of, of issues that all rests upon the penal system. All right, we're going to go back to a phone call before we wrap up here. And I believe this is Wayne. You there? Yes. Uh, go ahead. Thank you for taking the call. Thank you for taking the call. Yeah. I want to say something very important. Um, I want to say, I'm a, as a very former correction officer, yeah. They don't have any job descriptions for these uh, ex uh, offenders from getting out. You know, in the when I started in the, in the early '80s, they had a bunch of uh, female inmates going to Nashville Tech. Right. On White Bridge Road, I was transporting them. They were going and getting a trade and a degree to get a job for when they got out. Yeah. And some male inmates are doing that. They stopped doing that as an encouragement. And so, what do you expect when they get out? And also, I don't understand why they don't ask correction officers their opinion, what they need to uplift them. Right. I've had to help a lot of them on the streets. A lot of them probably knows, even the sheriff's department, he is getting uh, uh, uplifting, uh, locking more inmates up. Right. Because he getting more stuff. I don't understand why they don't ask these people at the parole hearing for nothing. We don't have a, a set so or nothing. And uh, who better knows than we? We live with them 24 hours yeah. a day. That, that's so, a good point. So I, don't, I don't understand that, boy. What's, what, what the devil going on here? And it's cash for prisons. Yeah. Like, let's, uh, uh, let's hold on. We just got these private prisons. Yeah. They, hold they on right there, no. Wayne. I got to cut you off because we only have like two more minutes because I, I really want uh, Tom to respond to this. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, as, as far as these these tendencies, again, to view to view offenders as second class citizens and to you know not provide the right treatment. Um, again, I mean, it, it's 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 really a large constellation of of steps that need to be taken. Right, but uh, he did mention, uh, and, and it is happening, uh, there are educational opportunities, which yes. those who take advantage of it, it could, it, it could really be huge for them. What a, what a big step, right? Absolutely, yes. Vocational training is right. something that's wonderful. Uh, when one goes on to seek employment, even somebody with a record can pursue what's called a certificate of employability. Basically, it's a court order where the judge says, I've spoken to this person, I've seen some character witnesses, and in my opinion, since the conviction, they've essentially been an upstanding citizen. That can create avenues to employment that otherwise you would not have. Right. How long is that process for the certificate? Typically, the process, uh, it is a court process, so right. it, it varies by county and by court. Um, but typically it's, it's a matter of, of a couple of months, two or two or three months ish. Um, and again, that's, you know, subject to, to where you are and the volume of cases that they handle. Right. But obviously you're saying it could make a huge difference. Well, there are actually some statistics that are starting to be put together. Uh, one of my colleagues, Professor Kara Suval at Vanderbilt, uh, she's told me that, uh, there was an Ohio study where an individual applying for a job with a felony conviction was about 9.8% likely to get a job. Wow. However, someone with the same criminal record who had obtained a certificate of employment 
had a 25 and a half percent well, likelihood of getting a job. You, I'm going to stop you right there again. Sorry, with TV, we got break times and everything. But uh, sure. Tom, we're going to let you go. We appreciate your time and hope you'll come back again. My pleasure. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Viewers, I'll be back to wrap things up right after this.